Good morning, everyone. How many of you have your smartphones and tablets and everything and ready to, you know, to tweet? Just raise your hand if you're ready. This is the generation that only co converse through, through cell phone and texting, right? So you are pretty savvy about what we're doing. Anyway, today is the third day in uh, annual communication week. Uh, how many of you here were here yesterday? Wonderful. What is it? A wonderful, you know, program yesterday and the day before and the day the day before. This hosting started last Friday with a great kickoff, and this is our 35th anniversary of doing this every year, where we bring in scholars, uh, media practitioners, students to rub mind and exchange ideas about developments in our area, media and communication. So today is the RTF Day, radio, television, and entertainment and recording industry. So we'll have a wonderful program. And before I call in our interim dean, I just want you to glance through the program that you have before you and see the lineup we have for today. How many of you have the program? I think we still have some left. If you don't have uh, a copy of the daily program, raise your hand. Could you, could you grab the daily schedule? There's some on the table right there. Yeah, please, come over here. Because we want you to look at the schedule, and you can tweet and let the world know what's going on here on the campus of Texas Southern. Tweet about who's speaking. Talk about what they are discussing so that people will know that you are actively engaged, okay? Don't spend all that money, expensive money, buying expensive cell phones and you don't use it for any productive purposes. You must be able to monetize your phone. Whatever device you use, it has to bring in good dividend for you, whether it's in terms of academia or in terms of charting your professional career. Uh, I think that's some of the focus that we're going to have. So today, um, let me call on our interim dean, um, a man who has produced documentary film for over 20 years. Uh, right now, he's a uh, professor in the Department of Radio, Television, and Film, and soon to be our interim dean, Professor Reza Pude, to give us a greetings. Give a big round of applause to Reza Pude. Thank you, Dr. Yolesi. And on behalf of the dean of the school, still I'm not dean, Dr. Ward still is the dean of School of Communication, and on behalf of bringing greetings to you. Uh, today is the third day, RTF, ERM day. I think most of you are here probably are ERM or RTF, right, students? Uh, I just want you to know that, you know, this takes a long time to uh, plan and schedule a program like this for a week. And uh, with the leadership of Dr. Yolasi, it has happened. And I'm sure that you all, if you were here yesterday, you see that how proud are we when bringing all these people, all general managers from all the TV stations here. See, the, one of the problems we have here, when we have good things going on at TSU, nobody knows, right? But as soon as you have a negative publicity, everybody knows about that. Nobody covered that yesterday, but you didn't see it. Did you see any TV stations, Channel 2, 11, 13 being here? No one covered that? No, they didn't. But the fact is that it's good for to bring in these people in and know that we are doing a lot of good things. And it, you know, it, it reflects. Whether you, they like it or not, that's what's happening. Uh, uh, my, uh, of course, we are going to talk about uh, the conference and all that. So first, I want to thank Dr. Yulasi with his leadership. Uh, chairing this uh, communication week 2015 and his team and I'm especially want to thank uh, uh, Professor Winslow Jeffries you know he's really been a, a, an instrumental of not just in putting this program together but also helping us with the, all the technology that I see is a lot of work going on behind the scene to see what you see on the screen here and a lot of people have worked with them so I don't want to name each one of them and because a lot and I don't want to miss anyone and also the faculty. Faculty has been very supportive. You know, we all, like a family, want to work together to bring better uh, program to you and better technologies to you. So uh, having said that, we have a new program in RTF. Most of you have been advising you. You see that. I'll tell you that since uh, fall of 2014, we have a new program in RTF. 
and we have a new program in ERM. The ones who are in, in ERM before um, 2014 you know how complicated it was. You had to take courses in, uh, in business school. A lot of you complain about that. Some of you did not pass in, in accounting courses or marketing courses. Now all the courses are offered here and we are from pro uh, our point of view. So it's a great program, ERM, Entertainment Ma uh, Management Recording Industry and radio and television and film. You know, we all, it used to be called TC program, right? Telecommunication, which was, our, it was an old term that had been used. Uh, we had a lot of calls in the 90s, I remember that, having a lot of calls from people who thought it was, this was an engineering program. It's not an engineering program, it's a production program, okay? That trained you to be good storytellers. So since uh, fall of 2014, after five years of working with the state, we managed to put all our programs. We have now 10 new film programs only on our, um, our curriculum that it was approved by the state to offer. Um, starting this fall, we have a new uh, graduate program that was approved actually two weeks ago. We have to go and defend it and justify that what we're offering is courses. One of them is actually professional communication. It's not online yet, it's not been posted yet, but as soon as it's posted up with everyone who knows, so those of you who are graduating and you're thinking about entering a new uh, graduate program, I think you may want to look at that. Uh, the curriculum we have currently in place has been, it's been here since uh, the 70s. So we have completely revamped that. So I'm very excited. It's not just having, and I'm telling the students, if you really just want to be editor, we just want to be photographer, if you just want to be, be uh, you know, a, a technical person, all you have to do is just go to HCC or go to, like, Art Institute. I taught in Austria for some years, too. But here, you are getting actually an education to be, become an informed storyteller. And that's what we're, uh, all the panels yesterday, and also I have to mention uh, uh, Professor Sandy for Walker for putting this, a tremendous amount of work goes into the panels you organized yesterday. And everybody enjoyed that. And I hope that you enjoyed the panels we have today. Um, so what, so uh, not only we're working around you know, changing our curriculum, but we also need that we have to new technologies, right? Of course, now you can use your cell phone. There are film festivals that just the films that are produced on your iPhone. So there are no excuses not to be good storytellers, right? You can just go out. Back then, I remember in the 90s, Students had to fight over our VHS cameras. You remember VHS cameras? You know, some of you probably are you too young even to remember that. But that's what happened. And a lot of our students back then produced film on VHS. And one of them is uh, Tyron Dixon, who actually is the only student that made it to American Film Institute. And he taught here. Some of you probably know him. And he won an award uh, on a film, 5150. And he, he was presented with a Remy Award uh, last Saturday. So these are all bringing a lot of good publicity for our program. A lot of people do not know that TSU has an RTF program. Okay, did you know that? They don't know. So I'm hoping that you actually become the ambassadors of this program. You know, go out and encourage people, your friends and family that you know, not only from the state of Texas, but from the states to come, come to this program. And I'm sure that, you know, with the help of a lot of, have you noticed, we have brought a lot of alumni who are actually going to be a panel of them later on today. And they are professionals. And they've gone to TSU, okay? And they are making names, actually. So what they, I, I really encourage you all to be serious. If you're not compassionate about what you want to do, if this is something that you're not excited about doing when you get up early in the morning, this is not for you. So I've been telling my students that when you take RTF 230, RTF now is RTF 130, of course, and RTF 131, and you see that this is not your niche, this is not for you. You need to transfer to another place, okay? Go declare something. Do not waste your time. I have students who have gone from RTF to pharmacy and vice versa. I have a people from pharmacy who came back and said, why are you coming back to RTF? You know, this is really, you might start forever and you may become, you know, rich overnight. 
You never know, right? In this business, nobody can tell anyone you cannot make it. All of you can make it in business, but it all depends on you. And we are here to help you. This is not high school. We are guiding you. You, you actually need to come in and knock my door and other you know, professors door and ask, for, and ask question. Be very inquisitive, okay? That's what you need to do. Okay, just the virtue of coming to class and just leave does not, you might get a piece of paper that said you have a bachelor degree in this subject or on that, but as soon as somebody gives you a job and you cannot perform, what happens? You're out of the door, okay? I have, don't have to tell you this. So please be serious in what you do, okay? Do I need to more, talk more? Okay, I think, um, so as I said, you know, to wrap it up, I, I'm, I'm really excited about our new program. For those of you who are of ERM and RTF, these are exciting years, and I'm hoping that we can bring more technology so we have, we are, in, we are working with uh, Office of Information Technology to bring more equipment, more computers for our students actually to work on. We have to working on getting more cameras for you to work on. But as I said, you know, a lot of you already have your equipment. You have your cameras. And if you want to be a storyteller, go ahead and do it. Just do it, okay? Now we have a film festival. I'm not sure how many entries we have. I mean, it's very limited. So I was kind of disappointed. I, I, I hope that we get maybe 200 entries. But that has not happened. Hopefully, starting next year, we're going to have about two, 300 just you know, narrative and documentary films. That's what I'm going to happen next year when I talk to you here, okay? That would be your promise to me. Okay, um, um, now we're going to have to go to Mr. Alon Butler. He has a lot to do with what we streaming, and he is actually a guru in, a, in social media. Mr. Butler, come over. Thank you. Have a good one. Thank you. Hello, welcome. So just so I get a gauge of the room, how many people are RTF majors? ER major, ERM majors? Okay. Uh, other journalism? Okay. So um, this is RTF uh, ERM day, and we've got a very, very exciting lineup um, as soon as I'm done. Um, we have a panel, um, we have a discussion on Empire, which is our first one, which will start right after I'm done speaking, and that's called The Cost of a Cookie. Um, and that starts at 9.45, so if you don't have to leave, I suggest you don't. Um, but first of all, I want to thank our sponsors, which are Houston First Corporation, ABC 13, Fox 26, NBC, KPRC 2, CBS Channel 11, KHOU, KTSU, 9.9 FM, um, Mr. Matthew Knowles, uh, the CEO of Music World Entertainment, who will be here shortly. And they have a panel at 11, right after the Empire panel, which is um, going to be about, uh, it's going to be uh, direct from Rec Shop Records, um, Matthew Knowles, and Lil Kiki, I believe. Um, after that, we have a panel of alumni from this university who work in entertainment. So we've got Ron Hurd, who's the vice president uh, of Def Jam. Uh, we have John Tucker, who is uh, director. Uh, he's worked on, some of you who have his class, he's worked on pretty much everything. He's currently working with Ludacris, LL Cool J, on an animated television series uh, that'll hopefully be airing soon. Got Cliff McBean, who's back there in the control room running this live stream that you can watch live on your tablet, phone, computer. So if you have friends that don't go here, couldn't make it. Um, the Twitter wall, if you hashtag TSU Com Week, you can find the live stream link and you can watch on your mobile device. Uh, and after that, we've got um, Eric Baker, who is director of sales for Magic 102. But he was also just named um, Future Innovator in Radio by Radio Inc. Magazine, which is a trade publication that talks about radio. So um, Eric and I spent time together at South by Southwest. Um, so he is one of the future leaders of radio. So he will be here this afternoon uh, speaking about you know, the future of radio 
um, what that is and what that looks like, um, and then generally talking about innovation. We've also got um, students that were presenting their app. So they've developed a, a they've developed a uh, music related app that they'll be presenting. They're Texas Southern, one is a Texas Southern University student. He's in the School of Business. Oh, we've also forgot Mike Mobile, who is uh, also a TSU alum. Oh. He's also a TSU alum, and he uh, most recently just finished working for Atlantic Records. He was a and at Atlantic Records for many years, so um, th that should be an exciting panel. Oh, I forgot. Carolyn Campbell of Houston First Corporation is also a sponsor. Um, if you don't know what Houston First is, that's like the, they're in charge of promoting um, commerce in Houston. So. Everybody pull out the phone. Pull out your phones, pull out your phones, pull out your phones. So I want you to, we trended yesterday. I want to trend today on Twitter organically. So if you could tweet and use the hashtag TSUcomweek so that you show up on the screen. Now I'm starting to see it. There we go. Help us trend. Um, real quick, any, any, uh, who was here yesterday? Okay, so about a quarter of you. Um, I want to say something about basically communication week in general. Traditionally, you, you think of, you know, we have, I know we have journalism day, I know these are separated in the days, but it doesn't matter if you want to be in journalism or film or television or music, the, the walls have broken down. And one of the things um, I said on my panel at South by Southwest was that all these skill sets, you know, now overlap. Um, what you're going to learn today, a lot of it is going to be, you know, radio is not just, you know, turning on your dial. Radio is Pandora, radio is on demand, radio is podcasting. <coughs> radio is, is filmed, um, a lot of podcasts, a lot of radio shows. If you watch, if you listen to Sway in the Morning, if you, you know, watch, listen to anything that's on radio, if you go on your YouTube channel, you can watch that live. So is that still radio? Or is that film? Or is that television? Where is that? You know, so there's a lot of overlap. So I encourage you to, even if you're not an RTF or entertainment recording management major, that you stay and pay attention to you know what's happening, even in publishing. Publishing is now vlogging. Publishing is now um, you know video. Um, recently, Culture Map, which is a local publication, they're ninety percent writing right now. They just got purchased, and they said in the next eighteen months there will be ninety percent video and only ten percent writing. So, you know, that's important. That's an important shift that we want TSU students to understand. Um, also, when these speakers are up here, make sure you, you meet them and engage them because they're here for you. A lot of these are alumni who've come back on their own dime. You know, they flew themselves to Houston because they don't live here. They live in Atlanta, they live in LA, they live in New York. They flew themselves here to participate with you and that's gonna be the source of your internships, that's going to be your future jobs. Those are going to be people that you need to network with. Don't be shy. A closed mouth doesn't get fed. So to kind of echo what Dr. Pude said, we are really um, pulling and organizing alumni to come back and engage with current students so that you have the opportunities that you deserve. So are they ready for the next person? Yeah. Check. So, um, let's see, I am done, and two minutes, okay. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to 
show you a, um, can you queue up? I know. <laughs> oh, she's done. All right, never mind. So we're going to queue up the PowerPoint for, so the, um, tell you a little bit about Denise. Denise is a good friend of mine. She has worked at um, AOL. She's worked at, uh, she's, she's done so many things. She's a generalist. Um, but I asked her to, uh, she's also a specialist in communication. So what I asked her to do was, you know, we talk about this topic just as friends. And I thought it would be a good subject and a um, good topic to discuss because Empire is the number one show. And so with Empire being the number one show, what has happened is the opportunities in television and film for you know, people of color have grown exponentially. Um, one of the opportunities we have is the Fox HBCU Alliance. And Fox, um, she was supposed to be on today, but I think we're going to try to do it tomorrow. She had a scheduling conflict. But if you go to Fox HBCU Alliance, they have internships at Fox that are paid in Los Angeles. And if you sign up, it's free. If you go to HBCU, you can sign up. So they have writing fellowships. They have writing internships, producing internships, um, anything that you want to do in television or film, Fox has that opportunity. Um, and we are the fifth HBCU to be an official partner. We just became an official partner with Fox and their HBCU Alliance last week. So that entitles us to um, special screenings. Um, last year, of course, there's four schools that were partner, which are Howard, Hampton, Morehouse, Spelman, they got the advanced screening of Empire. So I'm pushing for TSU to have the advanced screening of Empire in the fall before it comes out. I, I saw the screening of Empire a month before it even aired. So, so did those other schools. So now that TSU is the official partner, we will have the opportunity to have advanced screenings, advanced scre film screenings, but most important, those opportunities for you guys to go to Los Angeles or New York, do internships, and you know, be in the system so that by the time you're a senior, you know, you've already got a job. They're offering you a job. So, without further ado, I'd like to introduce. You have a question? No, you go to you go to on Facebook. You go to Fox HBCU Media Alliance, like the page, and then they have a link to the to the application, so you can join as a student, and it's absolutely free. So I'd like TSU to be, um, you know, one of the top schools. So when when she looks on there in that list and she sees schools, TSU has the most students because the one with the most students going to get the most opportunity. Other four what? Oh, Houston. I mean Howard, Hampton, Morehouse, and Spelman. So oh, he went to Morehouse. Ignore him. <laughs> so without further ado, Miss Denise Hampton. So she's going to take questions. So we're going to pass around two mics in the audience, so we can hear, so we can get it. Good morning, good morning. Ooh, let's try it again. Good morning. Good morning. How's everybody doing today? Um, I am so excited to be here. Um, not excited that we don't have PowerPoint, but very excited to be here. Um, I am fascinated by the imagery of black women in America. It's kind of a theme. It's been something I've really thought about for a lot of years. And so, of course, you know, who loves Empire? Anybody love the show Empire? Um, when Empire came on the scene, I couldn't help but take some time to do real analysis of what where we've come, how far we've progressed, and where we are today as a function of um, the imagery of black women and how they're presented. So we're kind of between. <laughs> 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 
Am I losing? Let, let's take a two minute break and let everybody who's got to leave, leave, and then I'll start again. Can move up, maybe. Let's let's get it together. Was it me? Was it something I said? <laughs> All right, this is actually even better. I was still gonna make. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about me. Um, I, am, I have a master's degree in communication from Abilene Christian University. Um, I have worked in corporate America. I've worked in entertainment. I've actually been the first black woman in probably about four different situations. So consequently, I have a very interesting perspective on how people see us when they don't know us. You know, when we're the first person enter entering an environment. Um, I have a good friend of mine who went to Japan, and um, a, a beautiful black woman, and, she, and a young um, Japanese man walked up to her and said, what up, ho? Because he thought that's how you greet black women. That's how you talk to black women. When we are, everybody in this room, hopefully, is a creator. We are, in, in ele any element of film, video, um, journalism, communication, you communicate a vision of who we are and what we are. And that was a powerful experience for her to think that what our export is, what we export to the world, what does it tell, what are we telling the world about who and what a black woman is? Right? Um, so my journey in this space started about 10 years ago. I don't know if anybody in here is familiar with Jones Magazine. My room, college roommate and I um, started Jones Magazine here in Houston. And now it's a nationally published magazine. The headquarters is now in New York. But we started it because we didn't see ourselves. Right? And just a thought, like our college, my college roommate and I are the ones who found who started this business. We found each other in college. So you're in an in a awesome Petri dish to find the people and, and, and um, uh, resources to follow your dreams and build your dreams right now. But basically, we didn't see ourselves. We had had um, years of being exposed to certain imagery. If we can go to the next slide. Um, the net, the, we had had years of the same kinds of imagery, right? We had maids and waitresses and housekeepers and nannies and, you know, occasionally the spouse of a successful black man, right? But we didn't really have a lot of examples of professional women. The one exception being Uhura in the middle on Star Trek, who she was a professional woman who was doing her thing, right? And she was a groundbreaker in a lot of ways. But the, the bottom line being that um, I'm, about, I'm gonna be 45 in October. And so like I can say that this was my era. This is what I grew up watching. This is what I grew up seeing. So then you can imagine how I felt when this lady came on the scene. I was like, what? A lawyer married to a doctor. Her family was intact. They weren't divorced. She wasn't a single mom. She was beautiful. She was sexy. She was talented. It was just like, who is this woman? Reading the articles about how it wasn't realistic. It wasn't realistic. I was like, well, it's going to be realistic for me. You know, like being able to see this amazing character and how it added so much dimension and so much um, possibility. That's what communication does, right? Communication creates possibility. And when you are an underestimated and a misunderstood entity, it's, it's incumbent upon you to introduce yourself 
and to tell your stories, right? You can't keep waiting. We can't keep waiting for other people to tell our stories, right? So it was amazing. She, she blew my mind, right? And now, if you go to the next slide, look at today's landscape. Wow, amazing. We have everything from a samurai uh, sword wielding Michonne on Walking Dead to uh, uh, a vampire, now she's a vampire, <laughs> to, to uh, uh, be Mary Jane who owns, who runs her own TV show. Like we have all of this incredible diaspora of imagery. And that's really what it's all about, right? It's all about telling the full story. In my day, you guys have a different com conversation now, but in my day, back when I was young, um, we, the issue, the argument was gangster rap. Like, should we, should we have gangster rap? Like, gangster rap is awful, gangster rap is terrible. I never thought that gangster rap was terrible. I thought that it's telling one part of the story. What's terrible is when it's the only part of the story told. And so I'm excited about this. Like, you can't even imagine to come, and just in my short life, to see how the stories are expanding and how we're on TV now, we're lesbians, we date white men, we're Republicans, we do, I mean, we do everything because black people are not all the same. We're not monolithic, right? So if we go to the next slide, and nobody's holding it down like this chick. Um, Olivia Pope is the Claire Huxtable of our generation in, in as much as we've never seen a black female Republican on television before. We've never seen two white men fighting over a, a black woman. We've never seen um, a woman at this level of political power um, and influence. It's transformative. And it makes people think that they can do things. It makes speaking multiple languages cool. You know, I call it the CSI effect. Right? You know the CSI effect? People like CSI, so every, every time you have a popular show, for a couple years after that popular show, you have kids in school, what do you want to be? I want to be a CSI. Right? Because they, people do what they see. So how powerfully important it is that we make sure we see things that we can do, and we're not limited in one box. Okay? So, you gotta take the good with the bad, right? If you're gonna have true freedom and true expression and true full continuum of, of um, communication, then you gotta go to the next slide. Then you gotta do deal with the, the next batch of stuff, which I don't really love. Yeah, y'all know these ladies? The ratchet. ratchet. Um, the unreal reality. You know, tell the truth. Do you like these shows? Tell the truth. Don't lie. Tell me why. Tell me why. Who's brave? Um, it can be entertaining at times. The drama kind of keeps you up. What's going to happen to me? Okay. I the, love the, spank. I still like the drama. Okay, what else? I look at the fact that the problems that you may experience, you like, but at least I'm not that. <laughs> it makes you feel better because at least you're not that bad. It's kind of the Maury Povich effect, the Maury show effect. At least I'm not that bad. Okay, what else? Who else, who else had a reason that they really like these shows? Tell the truth. They're funny, right? Because they caricature us. So everybody likes caricatures, right? And, and they, the, the hyper-sexualized, the hyper-aggressive, the rolling of the neck and the loud, and these beautiful women who are ready to tear each other to shreds and rip their weaves out. We love that. It's salacious, it's exciting, it's thrilling, and it's an export. This is exported to people that don't know black people. And they think this is us. They think this is you. They think this is you. They think this is me. Okay? But again, you can't have a piece of the story, right? You gotta have the whole story. And and the problem is I don't even think this is a real piece of the story. It's not even a true depiction. Okay? And and for the record, I just wanna go on record and say, you can't have a show called Basketball Wives and nobody's a wife. Just a moment of silence. <laughs> a moment of silence. <laughs> that is not okay. Real housewives and they're not wives, right? What a concept that, that this is how people perceive black relationships, black interactions. Women can't get along. 
were always fighting, we're always cussing. Behind closed doors, we would, we would cut you at the rope, we would like rough you up, like we'll jump across the table, don't mess with me. You know, that is that who we are, right? And and the and the again, it's entertainment, you know, the famous science um, line from Gladiator where he says, Are you not entertained? You have to watch what you watch. And watch and, and again, you can watch it, but make sure you're always thinking. You are the thought leaders in this space. So you, I'm expecting you to be always analyzing and conceptualizing what you're seeing. And that some things sometimes are tools. This is not power. I saw an uh, article a couple weeks ago about the, the power, powerful black women on TV, and they highlighted some of these women, and I was like, ooh, ooh. I'm not comfortable with that. I'm not comfortable with that being power. Okay, but we'll talk about that in a second. And, and my, my, my lovely sisters in the corner, the strip culture and how that has become our new um, model for creation of celebrity. Isn't that interesting? Um, I heard somebody say the other day, Amber Rose is, you know, the embodiment of feminism, black feminism today. And I was like, ooh, I need to think about that. I need to, uh, let, me, let, me, let me digest that. And in some ways, owning your sexuality, owning who you are, and not being a tool of other people is powerful. It is the, the core of feminism, but not, this, not in an exploitative way. Um, medium. So that's a different class, that's a different day, but uh, I expect that as young people who are learning um, these concepts and these themes in your classes, that you're looking at all of these, these um, imageries at a deeper level, and you're challenging what you're seeing. Okay, so we go to the next slide. Because we don't like it when they do this. It's, what'd you say? He said it's not their culture, right? Whose culture is it? Is it, is it our culture? I don't wear a grill. I mean, when I'm looking at uh, Katy Perry with the, when I'm looking at Katy Perry with the uh, Cleopatra or what have you, that's what I'm looking at when I say it's not their culture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the appropriation, w when we put it out there, the hyper-aggressive, twerking, hyper-sexualized black woman that is Black generated content, like I, I hate to be, I hate to be the bearer of bad news. This is not somebody doing it to us. This is us doing it to us. Okay, so we can't put out this hypersexualized content, this um, hyper aggressive, hyper ratchet content, and then get mad when that is taking the next natural step, right? Uh, I think that they uh, take what we, uh, me being from New Orleans, like twerking is big. It wasn't a symbol, uh, symbolization of what they portraying as in the media. It was a cultural thing. It was a way to find, that's how females find their husband back in African, in Africa. So they twerk to find their husband and such and such, but they taking it as uh, like derogatory towards black culture. So it was like when they say twerking, Nah, it's not what they perceive it to be. It's not, that's not what it was originated for. Mm -hmm. So on the aspect of that. But, but that's kind of the problem, right? You don't control the message. Hopefully we got some communication students so we understand semiological meaning and the, the evolution of words and the evolution of concepts. You put it out there, you don't know where, how it's gonna come back to you, right? And so there's a responsibility, like that's the point. So you're right, there's a root of where it came from, but look how far it's gone and how it's been misused and misapplied. The biggest issue with this is that black people themselves has ex have accepted this as their culture. Mm -hmm. And because of that, Black people don't even respect other black people that don't act like this. Absolutely. That don't. Me as an artist, uh, I actually had a conversation with your daughter the other day. I was telling her I wanted to bring a different aspect to the music industry, and she was saying, this is what sells. And I was like, I understand that, but you know, there is, it is possible to 
do positive music mm -hmm. but she was like yeah but you can only make it so far right. and it's true because at the end of the day black people themselves won't even accept you if you're not rapping about getting money getting girls but at the same time not loving them which is weird right. it's like who do we like then do we like other men like i don't like other men <laughs> but <laughs> and the thing about it is you know this is what we've come to accept and because we accept it other people think that's what we are right when we put that out that's who that's what they look for they don't look for a positive person doing something good they look for the grills and the hair and the weave and the twerking right right and and it's it's very interesting that when we see this we think they're acting black and this doesn't look anything like me it doesn't look like you it doesn't look like you this doesn't look anything this isn't me right but what does we've allowed being black to be in one little box. Um, there's a, a concept, uh, there are a lot of ways that people can be different, right? They can be uh, poly monochronic or polychronic. Monochronic means if I tell you seven o'clock, you are there at seven o'clock. Polychronic is seven-ish. Get, I'll be there around what time, you know, it's, it's very fluid, it's very flexible. A key way, another key way that people can be different is cognitive complexity and cognitive com simplicity. There are some people, when you say the word dog, they think of their dog at home. There are other people that when you say the word dog, they think hot dog, uh, a male slut, they think of 75 different breeds of dog, they think of all the, different, all the different possibilities of the meaning of that word. And what we have allowed is a reductionist cognitive simplicity of who we are and what that means. But going back to the previous slide, like all of these stories that are being shown on television right now, all of this, this incredible continuum of characters have really created a framework to kind of change that story. Being black means Bolivia Pope now as much as it means Amber Rose. How did that happen? Right? And it happens because there's people like Shonda Rhimes and people behind the scenes, and um, Tyler Perry, behind the scenes that are changing the internal mechanism of what stories are told. Yeah. No, nah, I was just going off of uh, what the poet has said as well, as well as what you said um, when it comes to making a change in the music industry, because I do music myself. Mm -hmm. it's, at first, it's kind of hard doing that because the way I dress. People not accustomed to the way I dress, mm -hmm. getting on a uh, stage in a full suit, doing music, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but when you start identifying yourself and you start um, doing that consistently and making sure that you're building your image, building your brand, that's how you're able to come into the industry and change and make grammatical changes instead of just making mediocre changes. Well, and I, and I actually might disagree with you. It might not be a dramatic change. It might be a drop and a tear and a what. This is something that's been built for 400 years. Which is true. It, it's hard to unravel. But the, you the, know, the way that music is going towards mm -hmm. now, like, if, if, at what, blah, blah, blah. Before, I want to say about a few years back, this was everything about music. Mm -hmm. But the way that music is going now, that tried to get play, underplayed a few years back, which is starting to come to the light now, is more consciousness. It's more being aware. It's more of know who you are, know your culture, as far as the meaning of what you're doing. Right. And I think that, that music is a piece of the story, right? And film and TV are a, a extension of that story and it kind of takes all of those concurrent um, media to really focus on changing the story and widening the story it's it's easy to be formulaic it's much easier oh you got a, a girl she wants to be a star all right throw in some braids and throw in some baggy jeans make it put in a, in a bikini on the like it's a formula that I don't have to think, I don't have to know you, I don't have to understand your complexity, I don't have to, people don't have, people couldn't figure out India Ari. She doesn't fit in every box. She doesn't fit, you know, Erica Badu doesn't fit in every box. So she may not make Beyonce money. Maybe, may, we're gonna talk about that in a second, right? Like, but the problem is money can't be the only gauge of success. So there's lots of people making money that I really don't, th I don't think they should be making money. They didn't ask me though, right? But you have to define success for yourself. And when you create images that are um, outside of the norm, that's a risk you take. But it's a responsibility. 
And it, it's paid off. I think Shonda's doing okay. You think she's doing all right? I think she's okay. <laughs> Shonda Rhimes. Um, all right, let's go to the next. Okay. So, you know, actually go back to the previous slide for me. I'm sorry. So, empire. Let's talk about empire. So, we talked about kind of everything that's happened before, right? How we had this incredible renaissance of additional um, imagery. And then here comes this show that uh, is kind of rocking the world, breaking every record, um, viewership growing every single week, knocking, having people reorganize their entire lineup. Every network is scrambling to pull together a black show right now, okay? Um, what do we think about it? You love it. Tell me why you love it. Because, like you said, it's telling another piece of the story. Mm -hmm. um, and in this instance, you just, I won't say a lot of black families had to go through it, but as far as the clips that they show when the kids were younger and they were trying to make it, a lot of people go through that in an African-American community. Now, as far as making it, it puts... <laughs> It's, to me, it puts possibility in that genre of people's heads mm -hmm. that there still is a possibility they can make to it too. make it, you know, okay. in that genre of black people, I guess you would say. Okay. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. What else? What else? Who else? Mm -hmm. um, if, uh, honestly, at first, I, was, I refused to watch it because, like, in the reality shows, I don't really watch them that much in the few times I did. Well, at least I'm not that. And I and I don't get um, too caught up in it. And I just refused to watch all the hype, all the hype. And I had to watch it for an assignment. And I ended up dissecting it. I did not necessarily care for the way that Cookie came about, but I appreciated her strength and the way that the family stick together. And also the way that the black community kind of like downplays um, or has an issue with uh, homosexuality uh, and things of that nature. I appreciated that it at least made it a, a conversation that it's not so taboo to talk about per se. But that's, that's why I liked it, because at least it, it opened the door for conversation. OK. What else? Anybody else? She said mental health issues as well. Here's mm -hmm. what make it, makes it so powerful for us to be in the writer's seat, is we get to a chance to change the perception of black people. We get to reconstruct how we see each other and how the world sees us. So if we're in the driver's seat, if we're the writer, if we're the director, if we're the producer, now is our opportunity to stop allowing for other people and other races to define who we are. Mm -hmm. or, or the lowest and weakest of our race to define who we are. Like, like I, 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 you know, I'm, I'm Jamaican, and um, when, from a West Indian perspective, one of the biggest challenges sometimes we see um, in the discussion of African American issues is ownership. We, sometimes you gotta stop and own your own stuff. You know what, that's not somebody else doing that to me, that's me doing that to me, stop it. Stop it, like stop, and call each other out when we're doing things that are inappropriate. Like there, there's a power that moves away from victimage of they're doing it to me. Sometimes we're doing it to me, okay? <clears throat> Good morning. Um, my name is Kenny, by the way, Kenneth. But um, I, I guess like one of my questions is, um, with Empire, the character of Cookie Lions, um, I, I, I like the script of like the whole okay, show. Well, well, let me stop you, because we're not there yet. Okay. Right now, we're, not, we're just talking about what people like about the show. Okay, so we're gonna get to questions, right? We're gonna start dissecting. So right. tell me, tell if you really love it, tell me why you love it. I, I like the script and okay. just you know, like the action scenes and stuff like that. Like it's it's thrilling to me. Okay. But as far as the characters, <laughs> it's hard for me to like. I mean, because I have two sisters, and it's hard for me to like. I guess have them accept the way Cookie acts, because that's not how a, a young African-American ha woman has to act. Like, you don't have to go to prison. All right, we're jumping ahead. We'll okay, get there. Right, we'll I'm, get sorry. There. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. All right, anybody else? I'll say why I like it. I liked the show because it was unpredictable. The fashion, I appreciated Cookie's attitude and the fact that she was strong and how everybody was just different. But another aspect of the show was everybody was out for themselves. Although they were family, everybody was trying to get somewhere and play dirty. And that's the reality of things in life. A lot of people today are out for themselves and worried about themselves. So that's something else that I appreciated about the show. 
of us said, okay, get away. Um, like uh, uh, Priscilla sitting in the front, when I first saw the uh, trailers for the show and everybody was talking about it and raving about it, I absolutely refused to watch it. I'm like, look at this. This is nothing but a bunch of stereotypical buffoonery. I don't want to see um, gangsters in the record business. I mean, I grew up in the 90s, so that's, that was my reality for the whole hip-hop genre. But uh, last weekend, I actually watched the entire season in two days, and I was totally captivated by this thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. And, and, and I think what drew me in was not only the performances by Terrence Howard and, uh, what's our girl? Taraji. Taraji, because they, they, they're awesome. They're amazing. But it's, it's, it's the music. The music seems mm -hmm. so so believable. And right. I guess because they have all these talented people working on the music, like Timbaland and whatnot. But it's, it's like a synthesis of great acting, music, solid writing, and even though it's centered in their world, it's basically like like our dynasty, because you have people that came from nothing, they created an empire, literally, and then you have the struggles within the family, all the dynamics, so it's not, it is not what it appears to be on the surface at all, so I, I dig it. It appears to be on the surface at all. No, I, I think and, down, and then the evolution of the character, you have right. Lucius, who, who was, you know, he was Preach, straight. Bro. Preach, He was straight up street, now he's like, <laughs> even though he's a gangster, he will knock you off if you go there with him. I mean, he, he's, what, what was it, the first, um, Record, record label, the first record label, period, to be on the uh, New York Stock Exchange. Exchange. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, his mind is, is out there, and it just shows a different dynamic to the individual. Okay. So, I'm, I mean, I'm really digging it now, to be honest. Okay. In the back. The reason that I like the show to begin with is because prime time, we have so many black people that are working that you wouldn't think would be on TV prime time, mm -hmm. other than Oprah or some other type show, uh, The Voice or something like that. This is major black people working on prime time television. They, they put some folks to work yes, on Empire. and that's what I appreciate, <laughs> about, Tyler Perry, I appreciate about the show. Between Tyler Perry, Shonda Rhimes, and um, Lee Daniels, they have multiply the number of black roles Absolutely. by 17 times. Yes. Three people, three entities, 17 times. That is incredible, of putting black people to work, because that's what it takes, right? Okay. And think about what opened the door for that precious. Kicking the doors. So, so we can go to the next slide. So cookie, right? The, the name of this class is the cost of a cookie, right? Like we talked earlier about imagery and how if you want freedom, you, you got to pay a price. There's always a cost, right? So you want the full stories and you got to have the real housewives and you got to have the black chinas and you got to have the gangster rap. Like it's a piece, a piece of the whole story. Um, and so cookie is interesting to me because we love her. And I'm not sure why. She's a ex-con. She is a drug dealer. That is what she did. It's not like she was framed or she was like, like she's kind of ratchet. She, she's, she's all of these things. And she's kind of a homewrecker. Nobody says that. Nobody says that. Oh, she's not? Tell me, tell me, she's not a homewrecker? She's not? So, so when she gets out of when she gets out of prison, is she married to Lucius? She's divorced from him, right? Is Anika in a committed relationship with Lucius? Do they live together in a house together? No. But oh, is it, I think it's really no, 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 no. See, and this is, is because Lucius wasn't loyal. It wasn't Cookie's fault. And remember what I say to you, that it's really powerful that you as creative people look a layer beyond, all right? The truth of it is, Cookie was foul. Think about it, don't, don't, don't knee jerk. Think about it. She came in, uh, the very first episode, Anika was an enemy. People don't even know Anika's name. What do they call her? Boo Boo Kitty, they don't even know her name. What did she do to her? What did An what did Anika do to Cookie? Yeah. I, 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 oh, she had her man. Her man left her in jail. Go to the next slide. Go to the next slide. I, I disagree. Is is Lucius a prize? So her so Anika's crime is she had Cookie's man. Do you hear how crazy that sounds? 
Cookie's lifestyle. Period. No, like, she, she didn't. Life, she had her kids. She had mm. the house she was supposed no, to live in. No, no, honey. It was her. Well, You're so cute. No, she <laughs> did. You're so cute, but it's not true. Yeah. Cookie was a drug dealer that went to jail for a crime that she committed. She didn't have Anika's life. Anika had Anika's life. Like no, that, whole, that, wasn't, wasn't, <laughs> that was an investment, but but we made it okay. And this is a really important point culturally for us to think about that we don't think about. It's okay for Cookie to roll over Anika because Anika is bougie. Anika is a debutante. Anika is biracial. She's light skinned She's this, she's that. Like, we made that okay. People don't even blink about that. If I am living with somebody and somebody's, my, and my boyfriend's ex-wife rolls up in my house and rolls up and starts taking over, I don't think I, you think you would like it? Right? But we don't do that. I think that's, I, I mean, I don't want to stay there too long, but I think it's very interesting that we don't think about it that way. I actually had a really intelligent, educate, well-educated black woman say to me that, well, if you can take them, you can keep them. And I was like, what? <laughs> that has profound implications in our community, right? That every relationship is up for grabs. That's Cookie's life. It's not Cookie's life. Cookie went to jail. Cookie is an ex-con drug dealer. <laughs> and, and let's stop a minute and let's think about why is Lucius a prize? Why are they pitted against each other over Lucius? Tell me why. I was going to say, honestly, Lucius wasn't necessarily Stand by. a prize for Cookie. Excuse me. I didn't even say nothing. All right. Um, honestly, Cookie wasn't, I mean, Lucius wasn't necessarily a prize for Cookie because she had some sense of foundationalism with him. Uh -huh. So it wasn't, for her, it wasn't, oh, I want this prize. It was, I want my life back. I want my family back. Okay. Um, the reason I appreciated Cookie's character is because it had a sense of underlying realism. Mm. Um, it was a relatable character to somebody who went to that story. My mom's been to jail. Right. My mom has sold drugs to do, to get money for me to put clothes on my back, to right. make sure we had somewhere to stay. So that character was a realist character. And yes, when you have that lifestyle, it does affect you mentally because then you, you are, you have the, you've developed a sense of, I'm going to go get what I'm, what I need, whether it be for my family or myself, because at the end of the day, she does love her kids. That was her foundation for Absolutely. everything she did all the way up into taking over the company itself. It was for her kids, not for her, not for any money she wanted to make, not even for Anika. It was because she felt like Anika was imposing. Now for Anika, I feel like it did have a sense of trophy because besides that, like how often do you ever see her do anything for Jamal or you know his kids or his family or even try to mother his kids? You know, <laughs> they're not her kids at the end of the day, but mm -hmm. if, he, if she really wanted him, as a wife, that's uh -huh. a responsibility you kind of have to take over because at the end of the day, you're gonna have to be around them. And they're grown, they are grown, but like at the end of the day, you have to be able to relate to them because they're one unit. Interesting. I completely disagree, but I, but I like the discussion. <laughs> I like the discussion, right? That's the whole point, that we should all be able to look at it from different perspectives because the reality of it is, I think my, my biggest criticism of Empire is I think it can be subtly anti-education. I think it's subtly anti-education. No matter, uh, you know, that this idea, and we love it as black people, we love the narrative that you can come up from nothing. You can know, no, you can know nothing, come from nothing, and you could be a gazillion millionaire. We love that idea, right? But. So Anika is marginalized. Anika is a black executive, probably one of the only black female executives at that level at a major label. She gets no honor. She gets no credit. She gets no respect. She's a trophy. But Cookie is real. So it goes back to that question is, what does it mean to be black? What's a real black person? If you go through, uh, in preparation for this, I kind of trolled a bunch of um, blogs and, and read all the memes and whatever, and the word real comes up for Cookie literally thousands of times. This idea of Cookie is real black, but Anika's not real black. 
the use of the term debutante as a criticism and as an attack. Um, Jamal, Jamal has, I mean Andre, that Andre is taking the, taking the company to New York Stock Exchange, but he's, he can't run the company because he can't sing. That singing, that bouncing a ball, that talent trumps preparation and education. I, I'm just saying, I just, I just, I'm just here as a provocateur. <laughs> I'm just here to make you think of things that you may not have thought of before, right? Um, so I think it's subtly anti, if you think about it, the only people on the show that are quote unquote formally educated are kind of marginalized. The behavior of kind of the, the more ratchet you are, the more amazing your character, the more interesting, the more multidimensional, the more real. I believe people uh, sided more so with Cookie because you get to look more into her backstory than Anika. So you can relate more to her, you can mm -hmm. feel for her more, and you can feel her sense of entitlement to the company. Right. So, I mean, if we got a backstory on how Anika and Lucius met or like what she actually does, then maybe some people would actually side with her more. I think, I think that the issue is, is that you shouldn't need that. Like, why do you need that? Why do you need an explanation of who Anika is for Cookie to be required to respect her relationship? I don't have to know you. That's that, you know, the man that tells you, she don't love me. She don't take care of me like you do. She doesn't, da, da, da. he could tell me anything, right? I don't, but I don't have to know her to, to respect somebody else's relationship. Just a thought, I'm just saying, <laughs> just a thought. But this idea of Lucius as a prize is a really interesting one. Like I said, I'll be 45 years old in um, October. I am totally open to all presents, cards. Um, I wear, I'm really tall, I wear a size 11 shoe. So just, you know, Louboutins are fine. Um, so I'll be 45 and I grew up on this imagery. It's the formula, right? There's a one fully dressed average or below average looking man in the middle of stunning beautiful women who are scantily clad and they're all clawing after him because he's so desirable. Anybody ever seen this? I literally have seen this millions of times in my life. Millions. I literally, this is the formula for my growing up. You, somebody said they grew up in the 90s. Like, this is the formula for every rap video. And so, what do you think this imagery teaches us? What's the legacy of this imagery? What do you think we learned? What do we teach? What do we teach young black men about women? Who, what'd you say? Woo. Go ahead. Uh, I'm gonna just refer to the song. I know all of us are adults in here, so my vocabulary won't be too strong. Uh, Careful. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I know everybody in here has at least seen the Lupe Fiasco Bad B video, right? That's the whole premise of what that song was about. You put one nobody dude in the middle of a bunch of women that everybody wants, and you're like, okay, he must be cool. He and must really, be cool. he's not <laughs> at and, all. And and it says. Women are interchangeable. Pick one. Pick one. Pick one. Anyone will do. Pick one. Close your eyes and point. Pick one. Oh, you got know. a hot chick? Wait. There's a hotter chicken coming down. Hotter chick coming down the street. Just pick that one when she comes along, right? So even videos that have one superstar girl in the video, they'll have a series of girls. There's very rarely one female lead in a music video. There's always a score of women competing and vying. That's why Scandal was so revolutionary. We were like, whoa, somebody's fighting over us? <laughs> Nobody fights over us, <laughs> you know, right? We fight over them. Men are the prize. What do you think the impact is sociologically of men being the prize instead of women? I grew up on Cinderella. Anybody grow up on Cinderella? The, the prince coming to chase me, uh, the Rapunzel in the tower, the prince climbing, the, climbing my hair to get to the tower, that the woman is the prize, right? But that's not the imagery that we have in our community. 
We have Real Housewives of Atlanta fighting, f jumping across the table, fighting over my dude, right? We have this, that the man is the prize. Thoughts? Comments? Oh, he already has the mic. The word thirsty gets invented, especially when the oh, dude yeah. starts thirsty coming around. and a thought. And a th we have a million different words for disparaging women, and we're teaching a culture of sharing of sharing. So literally, Cookie gets out of prison and automatically, these women are fighting over this man that's a prize. He's awful. He's mean, he's a liar, he's a murderer, he's foul. He literally left her in jail for 17 years and lived in a mansion. He divorced her while she was in jail. But he's still the prize. How, how did that happen? I completely disagree that mm -hmm. she immediately or that she, her intention was to get Lucius. It was about her hard work and ethic. I sat there and dissected it. Mm -hmm. Okay, initially it was about getting her stake. Tour. I want you to go back and watch it honestly, not taking sides, honestly watch it. And just realize that you don't even know the biases that are at work in the back of your brain. That's why right? the, the idea that, that um, well, I'm not going to say anything more about that. Just go back and watch it and really be fair. Really be fair, really think about it. The slights and the disrespect, like the idea that Cookie deserves respect coming out of prison, but Anika doesn't. And I'm not, and I'm not I don't wanna argue with you, I'm just saying just go back and watch it. Watch the subtleties of why, I mean, people don't even know Anika's name. And to me, if I was one of you guys in this room, I want you to be Anika, I don't want you to be Cookie. How is she portrayed? She was portrayed as a side female. She was in competition. She made herself compete with Cookie. That's how I feel it. Okay. Because she felt like Cookie was a threat. Like I said, she was a threat. Okay. Like I said, okay. like I said these, are the, these are the questions. These are the questions that you have to ask yourself. And it's like a, a, a nose. Everybody's got one, right? So the idea as creators of, of, of content that you have to think about these things and be careful about how you present. Be thoughtful about how things are presented. And there are things that are going to be at a cost. There's a there are that people can see themselves succeeding, and the hope that is given to people of like, wow, I can make it too. I can have something too. Like it's a powerful narrative. There are powerful kind of sub values in the show that really kind of make you think about what we care about as black people and what does it mean to be black. I am like a few of you who kind of resisted the show at first. Um, I knew I had to watch it because I'm a thought leader, so I knew I had to watch it. But I was not open, I, I'll say that honestly, and primarily because I don't want to read, I don't want to watch drug dealers, I, I don't want to watch that anymore. I'm tired of that story. But what I think has been powerful is they are really evolving the characters, even away from the fighting over the man and fighting over, the, like, they're really evolving those characters, and I think that's really powerful. If we go to the next Slide. I got, I got something to say uh -huh. about that. On that, um, about that imagery of those uh, videos. Uh -huh. I mean, that's all it is is male fantasy, though. Like that never happens to any male. Like you ain't gonna see a whole bunch of butt naked women around. One they male. think it does though. Because let me explain. Let like me explain something to you. I think I am cute. I'm cute to me. Yeah. Okay, and it has amazed me. I, like I said, 45 years old. How many, how many men that work in a mailroom and look like the behind of a chicken that think they could step to me? 
because they have been exposed to the fact that you can get anyone. You can have anyone. Just, you know, roll up. Like, just have swagger. Swagger's not going to do it. You need to come correct and have your stuff together. I mean, so the man, imagery, the, it's not real, yeah. but there is no such thing as real. We create our reality by what we share and what we present and what we. I, I don't think strip culture is real. Yeah, but under the male perspective, that's just that's just fantasy, though. We don't live by that like that right there. I mean, if I see a fine woman, I'm gonna step to it. If I'm ugly or not, it doesn't matter. This is my confidence. That's your confidence. Where'd you yeah. get your confidence? Where did I get it from? Where'd you get your confidence? I don't know. I just like me. I mean, if you're in love with yourself, that's where you get your confidence from. But but so you don't think, and, and this is important. You don't think the millions go back to the rap. Go back to the slide before. You don't think millions of images telling you that you're the prize in the middle of all these beautiful women has bolstered the, the confidence of black men in America? Well, I'm a music women, artist, women, what do you think about that? Anybody, anybody have an opinion about yeah. that? The women about yes. I have a, <laughs> I have a question yeah, about you think this you don't so so you believe in the creation of content and you believe in communication, but you don't believe it works. This right here. I mean, to me, this is fantasy. I don't see this happening like. To nobody. This Can I? Okay. These, these Let me get somebody that hasn't spoken. Okay. Not to put out my business out here, but uh -oh. by the way, my name is Jacquez Joseph, RCF major. For me, um, what this says, uh, again, not putting, being a gay male, mm -hmm. I'm from backwoods of Louisiana, um, you know, father, star football player, grandfather, grandfather, military, uncle, you know. This is, to them, what it means to be a man. A man. Because I'm not calling a woman a bitch or a hoe or slapping her or, you know, saying this about her. I'm not a man because I'm not doing what you're doing. I'm not mad enough. Mm -hmm. But when I'm out here, you know, my uncle, again, I put all of my pieces out there. Careful. Was the, <laughs> <laughs> just got out of jail one of the most prominent drug dealers in my city. Okay. And I was always told, why don't you be more like your uncle? Why don't you try to be more like your brother hard. or something like that? Be hard. Mm -hmm. be, be strong. But, you know, now I look at it. It took me three times to get into the school in a whole year. I'm strong enough to be, you know, not this. I, I, I kind of made my own image for myself so you know i love it Thank i you. love it but but that i mean the 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 challenge is it's it's dishonest i'm sorry what does that mean i don't know 50 minutes okay <laughs> the challenge is that when you create when you're a creator of content you hope that that content influences people but if you believe that you have to believe that content that you're exposed to influences you albeit subtly definitely influences your community. And we've had an entire generation grow up with this imagery. It has affected the women in feeling like the skirts have to be shorter, the, the neckline has to be lower, that I have to compete, I have to compete, I have to compete, right? It's affected the men. And I don't have to work it out with you. You beefing? Oh, uh-uh, on to the next. I don't have to work with you. I don't have to work it out. Because there's always another one because women are replaceable. We're interchangeable, right? So this imagery, this was, I hope a lot of people made a lot of money because this was very expensive, in my opinion, for our community. This perpetual imagery of black women being a commodity and interchangeable and fighting and vying and sharing. Any other comments about that? He's got one way in the back, okay. I think it's kind of a two-fold situation. I'm sorry, my name is Derek McKinney. Um, we can complain about the content, because I am a content creator, mm -hmm. but we don't create nothing that they don't buy. So if you change your mind on what you want to purchase, then we have to change our mind on what we put out. That's true. Exactly. So and that, that's to the point of what you were saying earlier. Mm -hmm. It's for us, as content creators, when I grew up in the era of, I'm 34. Our hip-hop and rap and music was totally different. I don't totally listen to different. anything that's out now. Mm -hmm. We had KRS-One, we had, I mean, it was totally different. If you look at the content creators who control what's put out there, they're not us. They're 50, mm -hmm. they're 60. They've never been to your neighborhood, they've never been to your city, they don't eat where you eat, they don't shop where you shop, they don't dress like you dress. But yet, 
when you consumers buy it, you allow them to dictate what goes on in your market. So you can take all the power back, just don't buy it. When it comes on the radio, change the channel. When the video comes on, change it. When the DJ play it in the club, request something else. But the minute you hit the dance floor and twerk, then post it on Vine and Instagram, you just told me you it's worth every do. dollar for me to keep putting that out because you're going to keep buying it. Now, the only, the only way I would disagree, absolutely great point, but the only thing I would disagree with you about is we are not the majority. We're not the majority. You, if we all stopped buying it tomorrow, it would still sell. Because the bottom line is that all it takes is a few of us to sell us out. All we need is a few Jay-Zs. I know y'all love him, but he has sold us to the highest bidder. Um, all you need is a few Jay-Zs. We're the most influential, but we don't, mar we don't galvanize that power in the way that we should. So, the, the, so otherwise, we wouldn't have Iggy Azalea. We wouldn't have Macklemore. We wouldn't have, like, the bottom line is we are losing control of our genre. Somebody mentioned earlier the music of Empire. And one of the really interesting elements of the music is taking back R&B. Like, R&B, for all intents and purposes, is dead. And Empire is breathing life back into it of like, listen, making beautiful music, not just the cheapest genre. Rap is the cheapest genre to produce. You, can, you don't have to do hair and makeup. You don't have to do um, sound background singers. You don't have to do, you can, just, you can crank them out in a factory. And that demand, that supply and demand of, of cost has driven down artistry. It's driven down. It takes time to create a Marvin Gaye album. You can't do that overnight. You can make five, you can make a whole rap album in one night, okay? So one of the things I think that's a star of the show is also the music and taking back a genre and, and reminding people, we create. We, we create. Y'all imitate, but we create. You had a comment? Yes, uh, great discussion, and I uh, really appreciate uh, the interactive nature of this, and I think it's going towards the direction of how do you create more positively, socially positive programs. And it's very important because these are future content producers. The argument about you, we give you what you want is an old one. It's like the chicken and egg, which one comes first. But the issue is now, what kind of responsibility does content producers take in terms of the way reality is reflected in the world around them. And to what extent that influences the attitude of you know, people. So the, I, I know there are issues with the Cosby show, but I think that was the first show where there was deliberate attempt to record what it means to be black. Yeah. And it was highly successful for that. So what is the responsibility of content producers to uh, do just that? I think that the responsibility is high but in the context of reality, okay? Um, like I said earlier, we're the minority. We, we're not, we don't own the machine yet, right? So there, there, even Shonda Rhimes did Grey's Anatomy before she did Scandal. Even though she had Scandal first, but she knew she had to do Grey's Anatomy and have success there before she could do Scandal. Right? It's always, it always has to be in the context of logic, and you have to play it out in the reality of your environment. Right? The reality is it does matter to be commercially, commercially viable. Like, you have to eat. So I can tell you, you know what, you should go, guys, go, go into the world and make you know, great, significant content. Wonderful. But you need to pay your bills. Like, TSU has failed if you're not making money in this industry. That's a failure. That's an F. Right? So you've got to figure out a way to work on, um, work in situations and affect change from within. I think very often we try to affect a lot of change from without before we master our craft. Um, back in the day, a million years ago, I used to work um, in production. I've done stuff in front of the camera. I've done stuff behind the camera. I actually um, was on the Arsenio Hall show. That's how old I am. Um, <laughs> um, um, you know, so that entertainment experience, I remember shooting a video, um, working on a um, behind the scenes in production in a video, and the video wrapped, and then they were like, okay, 
Team A leave, Team B is coming in. We were like, Team B? Who's Team B? They brought in a whole bunch of strippers and they brought in a whole different set to do BT, BT after hours. Because they knew we wouldn't do it. So I was mortified because I was like, my name now, I'm on the production team for this. And that's not what I signed up for. And a really wise um, person pulled me to the side, um, executive, she said, listen, there's six of us in this business. If we want it to be 10, there are sometimes you gotta pick your battles, and you gotta pick your journey, and you gotta be careful and be smart and be wise. So I'm not gonna tell you that there's not times that you don't have to compromise, that would be dishonest. But even Empire, if you go to the next, the next slide, Empire to me is doing exactly that. I think they showed you what you needed to see, what America needed to see to pull everybody in. I think next, next season is gonna be ridiculous because they're starting to tackle really challenging issues, really deep um, perceptions and really, like it's, I think it's gonna go to a whole different place. But they have to dangle the fighting and the rivalry and the drug dealing and the big house and the da 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 to be able to address the themes. And sometimes that's what you're gonna have to do. Figure out a Trojan horse. How do you wrap a message into something that people will receive? Because if they don't listen, if, they don't, if you can't get their attention, you haven't got their attention, okay? Um, I'm so excited about this show. Look at all of these different black women. I'm obsessed with Portia, by the way. I'm obsessed with her. I've never seen her on television. I've never seen any character like her on television. And I always love when there's a new, a truly new character like that. Portia is um, Cookie's assistant. I've ne really, I've never, I think she's totally new. I think she's a totally new, interesting, who is she? Now how do you get up here? Like it's just amazing. And, I, and just look at all of those actors. Can you believe all of those people are in one show? The number one, can you believe all of these at black actresses are in one show? Never before, never before. Um, any other questions? I thought we had a question about the um, chatterbox. I just, yeah, a little bit. <laughs> um, kind of going back to what the content creator has said, uh, I think that was really powerful. And that's why I still have a belief in this music industry. Mm -hmm. Because he is right. Like At the end of the day, as long as we buy it, it will sell. Because even though I want to challenge you, because you know you said sometimes you do have to compromise, sometimes you, mm -hmm. you know, have to give in order to receive. But at the end of the day, even going back to the whole bus boycott, if we wanted to do that bus boycott, but mm -hmm. some of us were still riding, then it wouldn't have worked out or it would have taken a lot longer because at the end of the day, as long as we're still compromising, that means they're still making money. That means it's still working. If you really, we can't put the whole responsibility on the content creator. We can't say, hey, you oh. risk losing all of your money and I'll think about whether I want to follow you I'm or not. not. Saying, I'm not saying put the responsibility on a content creator. I'm saying that it's unrealistic for you to think you're gonna control a whole mass of people. Because let me explain something to you. If I could wave a wand, just I would never see booty shorts again. I would never see. There's a whole bunch of stuff you would never see again. But how did Martin Luther King do you're it? You're not gonna. He didn't you have to do start, it. He didn't do it alone. He didn't. But he, he, he started wasn't everybody. Alone. He started alone, and it wasn't everybody. It wasn't but it was everybody. a mass, and it was enough to make a difference. And that's we what you need. Artists and to make a people difference. have to have that tenuity to actually say, look, I'm going to take responsibility, Absolutely. and I'm going to say, hey, I want to see something different, so I'm going to stop supporting it. Absolutely, if I totally agree to change, with you. You have to start and be that change. I'm not disagreeing with you, but what I'm saying to you is, every emotion, every behavior, every thought process, it does not occur in a vacuum. For example, I give I'll give you all a real life example. A friend of mine just got hired to be the executive producer of um, Real Housewives of Atlanta. not Atlanta, but our, but our real one of the Real Housewives shows. We hate them. We think they're trash TV. Okay, but having that credit puts her in a position, because she got that, just did that position, she just got called by um, Gina smith -Bladwood? What's the from uh, Beyond the Lights, the director, you know what I'm talking about? Um, just called her to produce her next movie. 
Like, you, it's really hard, and I'm not saying you can't do it, but by operating in the industry and being in the room and influencing, they want to do this, and y'all don't do that. Please do this. Like, there are times that we kind of create an alternative culture, and that's fine. That's what Tyler Perry did. He created an entire alternative concurrent culture. Mm -hmm. um, but there's time, what Shonda did is she got in the room with all of the white people and said, don't do that. Stop doing that. Mm -mm. Change that scene from this to this. And she got power and prestige and authority and came up through the ranks and now has three of the best, biggest shows on television. So there's more than one way to skin a cat. And it's not always step out. So we need to be in sometimes. There's sometimes that I'm on, like I, I do, a, I'm on three corporate boards, I mean nonprofit boards. And um, sometimes I'm, on all of them, I'm the only black person. So sometimes I have to say, mm -mm, no, don't put that on, mm -mm, that picture's not appropriate. Nope, don't do that. Where are the black kids? How come, so that's why I'm there. And so sometimes this, this, this kind of, we sometimes get a little cocky about stepping out, but we need to be in. If you really want to influence, if you really want to change, somebody's got to be in. It's a big deal that Shonda's in, and she's a part of the machine, okay? And somebody else had a comment? Yeah. Yeah, thank you for having us. Um, touching basis on content creation, I think the premises of the question that we all have as creative indiv individuals is how do we do that in a way that is viable? And at the end of the day, people want to laugh. Mm -hmm. People want to be entertained. And cry. And they want to cry and have every other fulfillment that connects to human emotion. And being 26, I'll be 27 this Friday, um, I was in the generation of growing up watching The Cosby Show and different strokes and the Jeffersons, not because I was born during that area, but because I was watching it on Nickelodeon being replayed. Mm -hmm. And I didn't watch these shows, neither did millions of others watch them because they were projecting a certain image. We watched them because they were genuinely funny. Absolutely. We watched good. them because they were genuinely good. And that goes back to talent and skill. Mm -hmm. How much talent and skill does it take to get three hoochie mamas behind a camera <laughs> and a guy with the chain. It doesn't take much talent or skill. Right. So if we all intrinsically reach deep within our souls and find what resonates with us and share that with the world and wrap that in the image of humor and fun and connection, then that is where the, the blood will travel through the vein of, of that aspect. Like Blackish, right? That's, yeah, that's I mean, I watch that show every Wednesday. I, ne I don't even watch Empire. I watch Blackish, and that's a modern day uh, Cosby show to it me. It is, it is. And I, I mean, I watch it all the time. So it is content on TV that shows us in a more uplifting Absolutely. view. Absolutely. But you Hallelujah. To watch other things, so. Absolutely. Yeah, you can't really say that, because I never watch Empire. I always watch Blackish at 8 o'clock. I watch, I watch both. Yeah. I, don't, I don't watch anything live. Yeah. Um, so they tell me to wrap up. Thank you so much for um, your attention. I really appreciate it. Um, and I've got cards if anybody wants to talk further. So, hold on. If you want to talk to Denise, she will be in the studio. <laughs> um, she's available in the studio.